today, 538 years ago, or that's February 3, uh, 1468, Johann Gutenberg died in obscurity in Mainz, Germany. <coughs> now, Gutenberg, though he died practically unknown, would be considered by many historians as one of the great influences of civilization. He was the inventor of the printing press, and that made the mass production of written materials a thing of the past. Uh, <clears throat> and departing from the hand copying by scribes in monasteries freed us from the authority of monasteries. Uh, the method itself, while we are thankful for their diligence, and industry, yet it was known to be so prone to error. So many historians today will say that this is one of the great advances of civilization, and I totally agree. And not only in civilization, <clears throat> this had an enormous bearing on religion. As I have said, it had set us free from the monasteries, so it set society free from the monasteries, and through the printing press, the Reformation cause advanced rapidly. Without the printing press, it would be unthinkable how Luther's 95 Theses would have circulated in Europe in the speed that it did uh, during those times. The Greek Bible, published by Erasmus, known to us as the Textus Receptus, was the first to be published in 1,000 years, and again, this was done through the printing press. <clears throat> Now, oh, this shows the power of the written manuscripts. And you and I, as preachers, regularly prepare our manuscript for the pulpit, unless you claim to have the most encyclopedic mind. We carry with us this manuscript, we guard it zealously, and we make sure that it is as clearly printed as possible, because that may prove to be our life in the pulpit. <coughs> Now, the discipline that pertains to the preparation of the sermon manuscript is homiletics. And again, referring to the diagram that you have, <clears throat> first we discussed yesterday hermeneutics, that which, in which the preacher engages his text, and today we shall be dealing with homiletics, uh, the labor of the preacher to create and craft his manuscripts, and tomorrow, God willing, we shall be dealing with rhetoric, where the preacher must deliver his sermon to the live hearers before him. Now, as I've explained yesterday, each of these is a course in a seminary, and what we are doing is simply touching the surface, <clears throat> but hopefully, we are touching that surface which will lead us to greater depths of our understanding of these disciplines. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. <clears throat> the preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails, firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. <clears throat> now, this is a part of that material in ex uh, which in exegesis is called a colophon. Uh, we would call it today in the publication of books as epilogue. Uh, in an epilogue, the writer explains what he has done and perhaps gives some expression of appreciation. Here, the writer is explaining <clears throat> what he did in his foregoing materials. He made a careful collection and ordering of his materials, and take note that he calls this collecting and ordering of material as an exercise of wisdom. 
and he sought deliberately that which will create delight in his readers. Now, considering that the best understanding of Ecclesiastes identifies him as a man who addresses the assembly, and many translations use the word preacher to translate Koheleth, Ecclesiastes, therefore this has a message to us. And let me put the message in this way. <clears throat> the preacher must labor to have a message in pleasant form to secure maximum understanding and acceptance. Ang mga ngaral ay dapat magpagal na magkaroon ng kaaya-ayang ayos ng kanyang mensahe upang para sa kalinawan at pagtanggap ng mga nakikinig. The preacher must labor to have a message in pleasant form to secure maximum understanding and acceptance. Listen again to what the words say. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. You see here, the writer does not see any antithesis between faithfulness to the truth and delightful presentation. He is faithful to the truth, but because he is after acceptance by the hearers, he sought to arrange it, he sought to collect it in such a way that those who hear will be delighted in the way it is presented. Precisely because he wants the hearers to profit from the truth, he must make the presentation acceptable, agreeable, delightful even. So he prepares carefully. Now if we accept this principle, again, let me suggest that we can indict certain violators of this principle. First of all, this is violated by those who associate dependence on the spirit with spontaneity. May mga nag-aakala, para talagang nakaasa ka lang sa espiritu, siya ang kikilos, eh huwag kang maganda. Kaya mong dumaloy siya sa iyo sa kanyang kapangyarihan at pwersa at saka mo masasabi ang espiritu ang nagsasalita sa iyo. Very often, the verse in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus was sending his disciples is often used out of context in Matthew 10, 19 <coughs> and following. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak, or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For, it's, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So they take this to mean that preparation is a lack of dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And if you want the Holy Spirit to just speak through you, giving the freedom by not being controlled by your prepared material. And this, of course, is totally out of context. Jesus is sending the disciples to preach the message, and they will encounter persecution. They may be arrested, put in custody, and it is in such exigency that uh, Jesus is promising the work of the Holy Spirit. He is not saying that when you preach before more or less a friendly audience, that you are to stand before them without any preparation so that the Spirit may empower you. The Holy Spirit, who sometimes may be compared to the wind, which we cannot control, is also called in the Scriptures the Spirit of order. You see this in the very instance of creation, when there was no form and void of the created heavens, uh, heavens and earth, we are told that the Holy Spirit hovered over the creation, put order into it, and so with the assembly of the church. If you want the Holy Spirit to be present, one of the things required is the order of the assembly. So next to indicting preaching that is patently false, preaching can also be indicted if it is disorderly. So those who think that to depend on the Spirit means no preparation, violate this principle. Another violator are those who determine faithfulness to the Word as offensiveness. Yung mga nag-aakala, para matapat ka sa salita, eh dapat makatisod ka. At parang hinahanap nila talagang makatisod, makasakit 
ng kanilang mga tagapakinig para bang hindi kumpleto kung wala kang nasaktan. <coughs> They take seriously perhaps the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.23, the preaching of the cross is offense to the Jews, stumbling block. And they set out to really create offense and stumbling block to the hearers. Now, I agree there is offense enough in the message. You know, you don't need to add a preacher and his preparation or presentation to the offense already existing in the message. Remember chapter 10, 32, 33 of 1 Corinthians, Give no offense to the Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything, not seeking my own advantage, but of many, that they may be saved. So here you find a direct connection for the Apostle Paul between the disposition of wanting to please. Now, this is not men pleasing that compromises the message. Paul is clear about that in Galatians 1.10. If I yet please men, then I am not a servant of Christ. As far as the message is concerned, that should be intact, not to be compromised. But as far as presentation is concerned, Apostle Paul sees a direct connection between the disposition to please and the result of saving sinners. So correct any attitude that may come close to this idea that faithfulness means seeking deliberately to offend your hearers. On the contrary, Paul sought to please his hearers as far as presentation is concerned. So how then can we have a message that we can describe as having pleasant form. Now, according to the writer of Ecclesiastes, the result of his having collected and ordered his materials is that the preacher taught the people knowledge. So the order and form of presentation have the function of facilitating knowledge and understanding. And based on his words in our text, may I suggest two components of a pleasant form of presentation of our message, a good homiletical exercise. One is arrangement, and the second is reinforcement. <clears throat> First of all, then, arrangement. The ESV uses the word arrange. In the King James and the NIV, the word is sit, set in order. Now, the Hebrew literally means to make straight. It occurs earlier in chapter 1, verse 15 of Ecclesiastes, where it says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. So to make straight. So in other words, using that word here in the arrangement of materials, the writer is saying, if it is not set in order, it will appear crooked. This is what a sermon becomes that has no arrangement, no pleasant form or order to it. It is crooked, it is unseemly. And what is, what is it to have a pleasant form of arrangement in preaching? Well, a time-tested sermon arrangement is the simple outline. A message, a singular message with supporting ideas or points. A well-arranged sermon has a unity and singularity of message. And we arrange that in a time-tested way by way of outlining. <clears throat> now, I have nothing against a, a full manuscript that you carry into the pulpit and read. Oh, there are many uh, drawbacks to that. Oh, there's nothing wrong to reading as such as long as you do not deserve what Spurgeon once told his student. After preaching, the student approached Spurgeon, and Spurgeon told him, I only have three comments on your preaching. First, you read it. Second, you read it badly. And third, it wasn't worth reading. <laughs> well, as long as you don't deserve those comments, nothing wrong about reading as such. But then the time-tested way, as I've said, is an outline. And an outline must have a singular message. 
Brian Chappell puts it this way. <clears throat> How many things is a sermon about? One, sermons of any significant length contain many theological concepts, illustrative materials, and corroborative facts. These many components, however, should not imply that a sermon is about many things. Each feature of a well-wrought message reflects, refines, and or develops one major idea. This major idea or theme glues the message together and makes its features stick in the listener's mind. All the features of the entire sermon <coughs> should support the concept that unifies the whole. So you must have that message that will unify the whole of your manuscript. One rule here is that the unifying concept of the sermon should come from the text itself. Well, we studied that yesterday. Your message must be the message of the text. You don't impose your message on the text. You don't derive it from outside of the text. You take it. You draw it. You derive it from the text. And that becomes the unifying message of your text. And all development points should clearly contribute to and be limited by the unifying theme. Now here is an explanation for the lack of discipline of many preachers, especially the young ones who are still growing in experience. Uh, they don't know what to exclude and include. The discipline of exclusion is very much part of wisdom in giving our presentation. And what will give us the measure of inclusion and exclusion, what will you include, what will you exclude, is the unifying theme, the message. Listen again to chapel. <clears throat> With unity, a sermon has the ability to focus on a subject in depth. The scriptures fragment without unity and as a result of their transforming force, splinters. Preachers are particularly susceptible to following tangential thoughts and straying down so-called rabbit trails of incidental facts within the main points of a message <clears throat> because the outlines of our sermons are more organized than are their develop developmental features. <clears throat> Even subordinate ideas should contribute to the overall theme since the main points they support form the messages singular thrust. So that is an important essential of an outline, that unified singular message that unifies the whole. Do away with very complicated outlines. They are more fit for publication, but not for pulpit sermons. As much as possible, experience teaches us to keep to two to three layer outlines for the simplest of presentation. A major, uh, the message, perhaps two, three major points and minor points under those points, that should be it as far as simple presentation is concerned. The pulpit is not a place to compete with John Owen in complicating <laughs> your outlines. <clears throat> Simplicity is an essential to understanding a verbal presentation, especially preaching. Every preaching encounter should be a complete event. When something of God's word is taken and confronts the hearers and they carry with them something from the word of God when they leave the assembly. It should be a complete experience. And the outline has been the proven presentation for effective sermons. You know, pilots <coughs> have with them in their cockpit a manual for emergency situations. And this manual is in outline form. I mean, just imagine if it was in book form, a prose. And while they're still finding the place where they will, it will answer the crisis, they may have crashed. So an outline form is that which you carry so that you know where you are at and where you are at contributes to the whole singular message of your sermon. 
My challenge to you is pray for wisdom and develop the habit of making simple arrangement to your sermons. Discontinue and change absence of arrangement when you have no outline where what you carry is a hodgepodge of comments. And here there is a very common practice in preaching, where the preacher simply comments on verses in succession. And that practically is his outline. Let's go to verse 1. After some comments, go to verse 2. few more comments, go to verse 3. Please, write a commentary. But don't, <laughs> don't go to the pulpit with a hodgepodge presentation that they don't get the singular message of your particular sermon. This practice gives the semblance of being biblical, but there is no unity of message. And when there is no unity of message, there is very little impact on hearers. Also, discontinue and change excess of arrangement. When the presentation becomes too complicated, when your outline has very deep layers, this happens when there is, again, no unifying message to determine what to include and what to exclude. And what happens is that you have multiple number of messages within one sermon. Each message really is worth a sermon, but they are all packed in one. And very little impact again. You are not a lecturer in university required to finish a syllabus in one term so that they rush lessons. You are a pastor to ordinary men and women who come to church eager for the feeding of God's word. And make, sure, make sure they get fed a clear word of God from your text. Follow the sensitivity of the Lord Jesus in the Aperum Discourse, he said in John 16, 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And many of your hearers are probably in the very same situation. They can bear one message, but more than that, they cannot bear them now. If you are a resident pastor, there's always next Sunday. Don't rush. Just let that one message impact on them. And then the next. Feed wisely, sensitively. Properly set on the spiritual table. Bite-sized measure of God's word. So that it results in spiritual satisfaction. As the preacher of Ecclesiastes tells us, he sought to find acceptable words, acceptable to the hearers on our part, delightful. It may be a struggle in the initial stage for young preachers, but when you get the feel of it in experience, you yourself will delight in a simple sermon with a singular message that impacts on the people of God. One of the greatest <coughs> sermons in history, or series of sermons in history, was Jonathan Edwards' Religious Affections. It was preached in a period of revival based on 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. It speaks of him you love, though you have never seen. And, and Jonathan Edwards' purpose was to make a distinction, how to make a distinction between a true work of the Spirit of God against that which is spurious or neutral. And the outline is very simple, very easy to follow, where he would say this is not the sure sign. It may just be neutral, but not a sure sign. This is a false sign. This is the distinguishing sign of the true work of the Spirit of God. So you subject your <coughs> sermon material to that scrutiny of arrangement. Have you ordered it in such a way you can say it will be easy to follow. They will know the message. 
It will have impact by the grace of God. Every sermon that you preach in your pulpit is worth the labor of arrangement, order, something simple and satisfying. There must be arrangement. The second thing is reinforcement. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes says the words of the wise are like goads and like nails, firmly fixed. Now goads are cattle prods to get the animal moving into the right direction. Well-planted nails refer to pegs that secure a tent. And that illustrates, that portrays the idea of having tools in your material that will reinforce your message. And I, ref I use the word reinforcement to highlight the choice of such words that will reinforce your point. And in our training here <coughs> in Grace Ministerial Academy, to reinforce the sermon, you use illustrative items and historical cases. By illustrative items, I mean making use of analogy and pictorial likeness with familiar items. That is the function of the illustration. It is to make use of the familiar to shed light on the unfamiliar, to give picture more than just abstract proposition. And you see this in Ecclesiastes. He might have simply said, we live in an existence of constancy. True enough, but abstract. Now listen to how he puts it in the opening verses of Ecclesiastes. <coughs> Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. He's making the same point, the constancy, vanity of things, and yet he puts it in a way that you see it. You don't just hear the proposition. It is not just abstract, but you see the picture. And that is the purpose of illustrative <coughs> items. You can make use of factual references, data that demonstrate your points, such as statistics, news items, <laughs> But the point is, make it memorable by way of an illustration so that they not only hear, but they see, they feel. <clears throat> and your point is substantiated, perhaps by quotation, by citation of authorities and authors. Now, to have a reservoir of good illustrations, here is a simple advice. Do not neglect your reading for general knowledge. Don't limit your reading to your particular text and go to commentaries and background references. I said do that yesterday. But don't limit your reading to commentaries and to theology or to Christian uh, books. Widen your reading so that you may have a reservoir of illustrations from general knowledge. And then don't forget <coughs> historical cases, real life situations in the present or in the past that shows your point at work in real lives. And again, you see this in Ecclesiastes. He makes reference to, in Ecclesiastes 4, 8, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? So he's making reference to a present case that he knows of personally. Rather than simply saying materialism without relationship is vain, 
It tells us of a man without relationships, without meaningful relationships, and yet on and on he goes with his work, with no one he was toiling for. He also makes reference to the past, where <coughs> he says in verse 13 of Ecclesiastes 4, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no, lang who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. Again, this time he's, he's making reference to some, something that happened in the past. But the point I'm making is that here is the use of historical, actual cases in order to show that his principle is at work in actual lives. That is not merely talking of theories. So historical cases, because if your point is true, there must be a case in history or experience that demonstrates it. And there are many sources, biblical narratives, historical events, literature, recent and current events. Listen to Jerry Vines, Jim Shaddix. To be sure, illustrations often make the sermon and even save some of them. To say the least, the use of a suitable illustration can be the difference between an average and an outstanding sermon. We must make our sermons as lifelike as possible through the pictures that illustrations produce in the minds of our hearers. We can make the abstract come to life. Even in any collection of most influential or immortal speeches, you'll find this common component in these speeches. In any collection, one speech that will always be in the list is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Well, suppose Martin Luther King simply said, I wish for whites and blacks to unite together. Oh, that's the gist of his message. Would it be an immortal speech if that is all how he stated it? But listen, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, listen to how he states his point. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi a state sweltering with a heat of injustice, sweltering with a heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with his governor having his lips dripping with the words of nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. And that made the speech immortal. Now we're not out to give every preaching the I have a dream immortality. Our simple purpose is that it will impact upon hearers so that by the grace of God it will save sinners and sanctify saints. So I challenge you, my dear brothers, pray for wisdom and develop the skill to use enlightening reinforcement. Now, by way of caution, do not organize your sermon around the illustration. The illustration serves the message. Illustrations are not for entertainment. Illustrations are not for comic relief. If you want to be a clown, go to the carnival, not to the pulpit. An entertainment atmosphere creates shallow congregations and hollow pulpits. But having said that, we must be persuaded of the necessary place of case illustration and work hard to be good at it. 
listen again to chapel, beyond pragmatic concerns to maintain interest, I was not taught reasons for illustrating, and I have not always defended the use of illustration in expository messages, but I have changed. I discovered while pastoring that the mind yearns for and needs the concrete in order to anchor the abstract. This does not mean that illustration should be merely a cognitive crutch or a supplement to sound exposition. Rather, illustrations exegete scripture in terms of the human condition, creating a whole person understanding of God's word. They are essential to effective exposition, not merely because they easily stimulate interest, but also because they expand and deepen our understanding of the text. So in other words, it's not for relief. It is still the goal of seeking acceptance and understanding of your message by your hearers. Then one of the most historic sermons was Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and how he used many figures and illustrations to illustrate how tenuous is our condition where God's judgment can crush on us any time. Remember his figure of a spider hanging by the fiber of its web. And any time that web can, uh, can be cut off and the spider be killed. And where do we have such illustrations in our sermons? Now when you consider this too for your homiletical preparation, Again, you may find it a heavy task, heavy for your preparation. But again, I can only urge you to refresh yourself with the message that you bear. Are you still amazed by such a message? Is it not worth giving our best as God gives us grace? Let us spare no labor to have the best preparation for our sermon not to merit a reputation of being a good preacher sought after. That is not the point. The point is so that in that particular encounter, a man, a woman, boy or girl, might be impacted by the message you bring. So next time you go to your pulpit, have a manuscript, that is not just ready, but bursting to be preached. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Father, we thank you for the guidance of your word, even in the matter of arranging, ordering our manuscript materials. And Father, may we spare no effort in seeking the goal of the maximum understanding of our hearers, that they may find the words we present as acceptable, not because we are men pleasers in terms of our message. We keep the message intact, but we want it to be so presented in an acceptable delightful way that we can seek maximum understanding and acceptance of our hearers. So grant us the diligence, grant us the commitment, and give us the skill and the ability to grow in our use of good outline preparation and the use of reinforcement in our illustrations. And may we do this with the motive of glorifying you every time you stand before the assembly of God's people. Be with us in the application of this, in Jesus' name. Amen.